All right, just because we started recording, this is the workshop methodology, or sorry, mm, mythology as methodology. Uh, <laughs> my name is Allison Lubar. My pronouns are they, them, and she, if you have to. Uh, and this is Wednesdays on the soup on the stoop. So just a little bit about me. I am a high school English teacher. I'm at year 15 of teaching, which is crazy to me, but I also teach um, a philosophy elective. I have a couple other roles in the school, public school where I teach, and then I teach yoga at night. My debut chat philosophers know that nothing about love is out now with 30 West Publishing. Um, and I currently live in East Philadelphia, which means New Jersey. Um, but <laughs> it's my, my fiance jokes about that. So that's just a little bit of, about me. So about this workshop. So the debut chap um, that I just had come out was organized around Plato's allegory of the cave. So I thought about what makes mythology work so well as a method? What gives a chapbook an organizing principle? What gives inspiration to create a collection or a couple poems around a central idea? And that's really the galvanizing principle for this workshop and for the chap that um, I published. So in the chapbook, and I'm only gonna speak about this like a little, it's not all self-promotion, um, but it's organized around uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. And I broke the poems or I divided the poems into sections that focus on different elements of that allegory. So there's a section for shadow, there's a section for cave, there's a section for truth, a section for light and the death of the philosopher king, which comes at the end of the allegory. So having used that as an organizing principle, I realized how often mythology serves as not only an inspiration for writing, but as a way to organize that writing, maybe with the potential for something larger. So the central question for this workshop is how can we use foundational myths, myths to galvanize the writing process? So this workshop is generative. That's the goal of that. So ideally there will be between 25 and 40 minutes of writing time in various ways, depending on how many tangent, tangents I go off of. And it's for you to really mine your experience, for you to wait, walk away from this workshop, having not only maybe written one or two things that feel ready to um, grow into something larger, but to have a list of ideas and also to come away with this structure. So in terms of educational, a way to start to reconceptualize and or reframe the idea of myth and the idea of methodology. So how can you break down myth into sections or different components and pull something out from each element in a myth? and also learn a new brainstorming and generative process. Um, also to connect with others. So whether you're comfortable with sharing or not, you just wanna share in the chat, you don't want it to be read out loud, that's perfectly fine with me, but this is a way for you to really connect with and build a community around this idea of mythology. So maybe someone mentions a myth that's inspirational to them that you hadn't even thought of, but it's also something that you connect to. So that's something great about Blue Stoop as a community. And finally, to maybe create a vision for a collection of some sort, whether that's a chapbook, whether it's a full manuscript, whether it's a project, whether it's a hybrid art and verse or word project. So to get inspiration for something bigger and set your sights on that. And also at any point, if there are any questions, you're welcome to throw them in the chat. So I'm going to start out with what is considered mythology. So Google says mythology is a traditional story, especially one concerning the early history of a people or explaining some natural or social phenomenon and typically involving supernatural beings or events. It's also defined as a widely held but false idea or a belief. So we'll do, a. I don't want to get too ahead of myself with this idea of truth, but our definition, the way that we'll define mythology is a way to reveal truth implicitly, explicitly, or veiled. So whether myths are quote unquote true or not, there's a difference between literal truth and what Tim O'Brien calls storytelling truth. So if the truth it, that's revealed is something that's true about the human condition or true about your experience, even if the literal truth isn't there, it still has truth. So myths are both true and untrue. What's considered methodology? So again, Google define, Google the ultimate source of knowledge, defines methodology as a system of methods used in a particular uh, area of study or activity. So just so you know, I'm turning this way because I have a monitor here and that's where I'm, what, that's where I'm reading from. So our definition of methodology is a 
any type of process, any kind of frame, or any any kind of foundation for another experience. I've been using the word galvanize a lot, but also it can serve as a catalyst for an experience or the beginning of an experience. So some examples of myths that you may be familiar with that have evolved into something um, more modern or that writers or artists have taken in another direction. So the first is the Penelope ad, which was written by Margaret Atwood. So Margaret Atwood took the story of the Odyssey and rewrote much of that from Penelope's perspective and has a really interesting interlude in between each chapter of Penelope's maids. And so that's written in verse. So we have this um, this kind of hybrid text in a really interesting way that takes something from another character's perspective and uses elements of mythology. Another example is one of my personal favorites, very, very formative for me was Hed Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which was an off-Broadway musical at first and then made its way to Broadway and has existed for a long time. But now, um, but this text uses Plato's Symposium and the idea of the origin of love as a foundational aspect of the protagonists search for their other half. Um, and whether that is the other half in another person or the other half really as the self because no one is incomplete, which is essentially the thesis, one of the thesis theses of this work. Um, final example is a little bit of art. So this is one of my favorite paintings, Judith slaying Holofernes by Artemisia Gentileschi. So in, and I, I took out the, the very bloody parts, even though you can see a little uh, splatter there, but Artemisia Gentileschi was a Renaissance painter who experienced all of trauma at the hands of um, male artists and a lot of her write, a lot of her writing, a lot of her art reconceptualizes um, mythology and even parables from the Bible in ways that are empowering to women and femi uh, femme identifying folks, as opposed to Caravaggio's portrait of Judith slaying Holofernes in which she's very like detached and she's kind of like, oh, this is so icky, but here like she, she's really, she's really into it. So a little note on cultural appropriation before we really get into writing and accessing mythology. So these are just questions to consider when you are writing about myth, when you're writing about ideas that come from outside of yourself. So who has ownership of myth? Who has access and who should have access. Consider your own identity and its intersectionality. You can consider what's my relationship to this myth and using a res using the myth in a respectful way um, if it's outside of your experience and culture. Also wanting to make sure that you're not looking at a culture that's not your own as a monolith um, and examining the fullness and richness of mythology in culture. It can be agency for creation and also using illusion. And I have a link there to it's a really great resource just explaining a little bit about cultural appropriation. It's about Halloween costumes. It's from a college, but I think that it does a really good job of explaining the basics of that. So you want to consider those things carefully when you are deciding to do a retelling um, in some ways. So one sample for you. Would anyone like to read, and I'm happy to read if not, um, this poem, Cocktails with Orpheus by Terence Hayes? I'd love to read that. I know Terence really well, so. <laughs> awesome, I know that voice. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Go ahead, thank you. Yeah, I'll have to tell him we did this. Cocktails yeah. with Orpheus by Terence Hayes. After dark, the bar full of women, part of me loves, the part that stood naked outside the window of Miss Geneva, recent divorcee who owned a gun. Oh, Miss Geneva, where are you now? Orpheus says she did not perish. She was not turned to ash in the brutal light. She found a good job. She made good money. She had her own insurance and a house. She was a decent wife. I know dissent lives in the word decent. The bar noise makes a kind of silence. When Orpheus hands me his sunglasses, I see how fire changes everything. In the mind, I am behind a woman whose skirt is hiked above her hips, as bound as touch permits, saying, don't forget me when I become the liquid out of which names are born. Salt milk, milk sweet, an animal made. I want to be a human body, uh, sorry, I want to be a human above the body, uprooted and right, 
a fold of pleas released, but I am a black wound, what's left of the deed. Thank you so much. That was such an awesome, awesome reading. So um, with this poem in mind, yeah, absolutely a great reading. Consider and take a few moments to think about, and I'd like to have just a really short discussion on, on how does Hayes use the myth of Orpheus to frame his interaction with his setting and encounter with Miss Geneva or with Orpheus and yeah, elements of the setting. So any thoughts about that or elements of the Orpheus and Eurydice myth that you notice in this poem? And again, feel free to like put these in the chat or to unmute yourself. Uh, Blue Stoop participants have been very polite about not talking over each other. So I'm assuming some order here. Uh, for some reason, I thought about Black Orpheus, that uh, that movie. Um, I don't remember the movie well enough to make a real connection there, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Absolutely. I, that, that's something that came into my mind as I was choosing this too. And I, and I don't know enough about Black Orpheus either, but that's another great way to consider how a myth has been used in um, to expose a different kind of truth. Too. So all of these things are generative also in, in a really wonderful, expansive way. So either any word choices or images. We, of course, have the name of Orpheus in here. And if and if not, like that's fine too. But one thing that I, a couple of things that I noticed with this is there's an interplay of light and dark. When you think of Orpheus exiting the cave, there is the idea of someone turning to ash. Um, there's this contrast between noise and silence. Orpheus was a musician. So using those elements in the setting and thinking of a bar as a kind of cave is really, to me, at least a very like appealing kind of imagery. Um, so, is, is it okay to read what someone put in the chat? Just give me a yes or no for the chat. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Sarah Davis says, the setting feels modern, but also could take place in a wide range of times and places, feels outside of history as myths do. Ooh, I love, uh, yeah, no worries. Um, I, I love that. So the sense of being outside of history or the sense of timelessness or this, the way that the setting is created without, without a sense of clear place and time. Um, yet there's so much specificity in some of these details. Um, the idea of made good money, her own insurance and a house was a decent wife. We know that this could take place in, in modern um, times just as much as it could like, like a decent number of years ago. Uh, the noise of the bar, the existence of sunglasses. Um, Blue Stoop said, Stoop said, I'm interested in this idea of good job being a sense of the underworld that Orpheus knows perhaps creating questions about what is death and what is life. Absolutely. Um, so when, when Eurydice found, or not Eurydice, Miss Geneva, right? Uh, so when Miss Geneva found like a good job, like what, like what is that? What happens in life and the afterlife? And what is the definition then of, then of good? If you think of the job of uh, someone in the Greek underworld, like doesn't sound like too appealing necessarily. Um, but thinking about those those contrasting kind of concepts, really great commentary. Anyone else? So give it like thirty seconds and. Uh so the oh miss geneva where are you now i find that interesting i i use that sort of uh that oh kind of thing in my poetry a lot when i'm writing poems about myths but i usually put an h there to modernize it so he's using like the classical oh miss geneva and it's kind of weird right that that's never gone away despite being kind of like this ancient plea to the gods we still sit at the bar and we're like oh so and so are you coming here you know in our head kind of so I found that interesting is like both a modern and kind of ancient thing. I think that's a great point, even considering how something as simple as like an invocation of the muse at the beginning of your piece, like what are you invocating? And even that is a way of using myth 
mythology as an organizing principle? What are you invoking at the beginning of this piece? Or what are you calling in after you set a sort of scene as well? Like really astute observations, awesome. Um, and I always, I, I'm thinking of the O and Orpheus and that kind of the sound, the sound of O and, and it's the same shape that the mouth makes too. So it's a very sensory letter for a word too. Really great. Any other thoughts? Okay. So in the interest of writing time, um, this, I'm, I think the presentation might be shared with you, but you'll be able to see it on YouTube again. I do have another um, bonus sample with Louise Gluck's Gretel in Darkness with some similar questions that I can leave this up um, at the end. But also if you're watching this on YouTube, you can pause this, you can look at the prompts and consider a study of this as well. So finally, what, what, what we're here for is pre-writing time. So I'm going to give you five minutes to make a list of eight to 10 myths that have been definitive or formative to you. Note, this is not a rigid definition of myth. Our, our definition of myth is a way of revealing the truth. So I have the grill dragon in here for in parentheses because when I was in preschool, I remember my dad saying that there was a dragon inside of the grill and that's what cooked the cheeseburgers. So could I create a mythology around that? Um, the idea of superstition of knocking on wood. So when you knock on, or just listing knocking on wood, do you put your right shoe on first? Do you throw salt over your shoulder? What kind of myths as superstitions do you have? Um, think of myths of family history, legends of, supposedly my grandfather used to go fishing with a baseball bat because there was nothing to fish with and he would just knock salmon out of the river as they were spawning which I, I don't doesn't seem real but it would be interesting to write about um your baby nerd self from elementary school if you love like lord of the rings i'm even thinking like bridge to terabithia and these really formative texts that became mythology for you. Also, the idea of anything that's a non-truth, so the idea of soulmates, whether you believe in that, but if you don't, then what effect has that belief had on your life or the idea of a twin flame? Or even, I made a note of this here, and I, I actually recently wrote about that. If anyone's seen Bridget Jones' diary, there is a part where Hugh Grant refers to the Japanese as a very cruel race. And I'm I'm mixed Japanese and I just put myself in the situation of watching that with my mother and my great aunt and how has cruelty shaped my experience or the idea of being perceived as cruel. So it doesn't have to be a myth that's like just Greek, like just Orpheus and Eurydice, just Plato, any type of myth. So now set a timer. Um, take five minutes. If you finish early, start adding some details or keep listing. If this list is 30, 30 myths long, amazing. Um, if it's not enough time, it's okay. You have the prompt. I'm going to put it in the chat. I'm going to start a timer now.
All right, so that is our time for just the listing part. If you're on a roll, like amazing, like keep like keep going and ignore me for the next two minutes. Um, so now I'd like to just take a moment for an optional share, or if you don't want to share um, anything on your list, you can um, if you can also speak to what came up for you or what was this process like I give my creative writing students these options to either like share part of their work or if they don't feel comfortable with that they can share part of their process or what came up for them. So one thing that I just want to mention too is I thought of another great example of myth in um, Lil Nas X's Montero of, of the video with there's lots of like Garden of Eden mythology in the very beginning of it and then very interesting dissension as well. So lots of ways to even see how mythology is echoed in the modern. So anyone want to share either anything that came up on their list or what came up for you? And again, no pressure. You can put it in the chat. You can unmute. Um, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, the One of the things that came up to me is uh, when I was a kid and I saw the movie Red Dawn, so the child warrior myth, if that's actually like a myth, but that really stuck with me. I can remember for like a lot of my preteen imagining myself like defeating the Russian army all by myself. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I think there's absolutely the sense of like the child warrior myth. And I think you're gonna enjoy where we go next with this. That, thank you for sharing that. Um, so in the chat we have, Blue Stoop said, my mother used to tell me a story about a town situated around a lake of milk whenever she gave me milk to drink. That's so fascinating. Oh. What, a, what a beautiful like pastoral there. Um, Michael McCarthy said, St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. Amazing. Yes, th there's a lot, a lot with, within that too. Really awesome ideas um, or things that you came up with. Anyone else? Is it okay if I just share my list? I just thought it was funny how diverse yeah. everything was. Yeah. So I, 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 uh, this was really great. I wrote down uh, Typhon, Python, mm -hmm. Delphine, Echidna, UFOs, Angels, My Lucky Celtics jersey, this video game, Dark Souls, and the furtive pygmy, and the uh, mythology in that, the myth of myself, the myth of gender, and then my last one, I'm from New England, was uh, Cheers, Wings, and Frasier. I realize there's like a whole mythology in those shows that I kind of subscribe to a lot of the time, so yeah, that was my list. Absolutely, and I think you bring up a lot of really great points around um, the idea of if something is lucky or not, like a lucky jersey or or a lucky something I think of Joseph Cam Joseph Campbell's um like supernatural aid like this piece of lucky something that causes something else and absolutely this can be expansive into the idea of a town having a kind of mythology or even like a, as a show I think like Twin Peaks oh my gosh right um I know my audience a little bit um but also yeah so um Louise said love the myth of gender absolutely so thinking about the the myths that we've been told or the things that we've been told that don't have truth to them or don't have the type of truth that we've been told exists. Um, this is really phenomenal. And, and even like what's happening in the chat also. Um, so really expanding that because in terms of like, well, what is considered myth? Like you decide, like you decide what's considered mythology in that way. Um, oh, so Melissa says the idea that praying to St. Anthony will help me find lost things or bad luck to cheers um, with with water. Yeah. Oh, to cheersing with water. Hmm. Absolutely. Or, or the idea of not looking in someone's eyes like when you cheers or that could that could even be. And even some of these things can be like details in poems or details in something larger. Um, Michael says beliefs, stories of the religion in which I was raised, Christianity, Adam and Eve, heaven and hell, God, resurrection, very essential myths, a material world, the ability to know anything, the hero's journey myths, yeah, Joseph Campbell, hard work is a virtue, Achilles heel, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of like these aphorisms, um, like a, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but those kinds of adages too, the things that we're told when we're little as a type of 
cosmology, really a type of our world making. And cosmology is a part of mythology. If we think of Joseph Campbell's four functions of myth, there's the cosmological function of myth, which is to help world build and to help us understand the type of mythology that, or the type of why things are the way that they are, why mosquitoes buzz in people's ears, for example. This is really phenomenal, everyone. Thank you so much for contributing and feel free to like continue sharing. Oh, Melissa says, um, they just taught the crucible to my 10th graders and we discussed the myths told within the witch trials or in the play itself. Amazing, I love that. So even how myth, how even the myths that influenced Salem become mythology in itself, how mythology is generative in that way. I just hope all of you walk away here just like ready to like, like keep writing and keep writing. Um, I actually just, uh, I'm teaching Steinbeck's of Mice and Men right now. And I don't know, I think I was nervous about this workshop, but I was like, oh, this is connected to Nietzsche's genealogy of morality. And I was like, I don't think my 11th graders are ready for this, but I like, I give them a little preview anyway. Um, but that's phenomenal. Like, thanks everyone. Um, so we're, for sake of time, we're gonna move on a little bit. Again, if things are coming up for you, put them in the chat. We'll bring them up when there is discussion time. So the next part of this, is what structures emerged in the myths that you listed. So we're not quite at writing, writing yet. This is still a type of pre-writing. So look back at your list and consider the structure. Are there any symbols? Are there any archetypes? Is there a storyline or chronology? Think of the hero's journey. Are there any central themes or ideas? Is there resurrection, rebirth, betrayal, deception? How can these be a lens through which to understand your experience? So go back to your list and choose two to three myths to tease into structural components. And you choose these components. For example, the myth of Pandora's box has Pandora. It has the box. It has the contents. It has hope as an allegory. It has the gods, the people who give Pandora the box or however she gets the box. I, I forget. I think it it has something with like, never accept a gift from Zeus. Um, think of who gives her the box, who decides what goes in the box. Why were those things put there in the first place? Why do they give her the box or why, what's the role of curiosity? So you can also make a list of questions. So you'll have five minutes to tease out um, the structure of a couple of these myths. Any questions? Oh no, it's okay. There we go. We'll get back to it. And I'll put that back on the screen. All right, I'll set the timer first and five minutes starts now. Mm.
All right, just finish up the last thread of what you're writing. Um, I'm writing along with you too. So optional share again. Uh, or what came up for you? Did you notice any trends or did you notice any patterns or threads? Did you, in, did you gravitate toward asking questions? Did you grab, was this generative? Did you start making a whole other list of things connected to this? So either how is this process for you and what came up or, um, or share something. And again, chat is great, unmute is great, whatever you're comfortable with. I'll go ahead and go again. Thank you, I appreciate that. It was very surprising, very surprising. So um, the second myth that I started this particular exercise with was the child warrior. Um, and when I first was writing, it's like, well, no one expects them, so they're successful. And then I started going more into who I am today. And I'm like, wait a minute, that seriously damages the psyche being a soldier. So in reality, this is a false myth. And I believe we that we as a society, we use this type of myth to entice children to become soldiers when they grow up. So my mind went to a very dark place and it was completely unexpected. I, I wasn't even thinking that at any point until it popped into my head. That is, that is so powerful, Louise. That brings up a lot of like even questions about myth of who is here. Here's the, a big question behind it is who is doing the telling of those myths and what is their purpose? So does it serve that sociological function? Does it serve a function to tell you what your place in the world could be or should be? Um, and the idea that myths can become a become a way to to weaponize um they can be a way to um 
uh, what's what's the word? Um, to uh, it's it starts with an e. It's the word that means to call something like less than what it is. Um, euphemism. So to euphemize, I guess to euphemize um, things that are really damaging or harmful. That's really really excellent point. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Michael in the chat said, I found a surprising depth to stories I was told as a child. What I thought were mere Sunday school fables end up possessing dynamics worthy of exploration, especially regarding what constitutes good and evil. Yeah. So what are we taught is at, like in Sunday school, like what is good and what is evil? And how is that something that shapes our experience? Do you grow up and realize how much of a lie something was, or do you see behind it? Or can you see how that was something that was really formative to you? Thank you so much for sharing that too. Any other thoughts, any other things coming up? I find myself also going to a very dark place, Elise, uh, and, and a surprising place. I, I'm like almost starting to write a poem about uh, I never write about my hobbies and my pastimes. I know a lot of people do, and that's fine, but it's not really subject matters I'm interested in most of the time. But I started writing two things, one about the Celtics and one about that video game series, Dark Souls, called uh, King Seeker Framped is Dead. And I'm finding a lot of like serpent and flying things in my uh, mythology for some reason. So this is all pretty surprising. Thank you for this exercise. I really appreciate it. And that's awesome. Even like seeing, seeing trends or seeing, uh, seeing commonalities in the types of imagery. So that idea of like something serpentine or something with wings. And then that image of like the snake with wings and something, um, that can be terrifying and, and beautiful and otherworldly in such a way. Absolutely. Um, I, I just, I just thought of like, um, I, I grew up playing video games and I was like, what if you saw like Crash Bandicoot as your mythology or like Mario Kart? Um, can you imagine like a chat book about Super Mario? I mean, there'd be like licensing things, of course, but um, but yeah, like all of these things are apt subjects for poem be poems and, and writing because they have meaning and what is writing, but how to make meaning out of the world and how to connect with others. So really awesome. Um, <laughs> yes, Mario Kart. Um, anyone else? Maybe take like one more. So I want to give you time for writing. Um, I, I'll share. Um, okay. This brought up really old fears for me. Um, the neighborhood kids always said there was a boogeyman in the woods, and I believed them. And so um, what I wrote was in my mind's eye, he rode a big, loud motorcycle. Think Hell's Angels meets the Proud Boys. He's always in hiding, waiting for his next prey. Think a young girl all alone think the Blair Witch Project. And then I, as I was thinking about it, you know, it was kind of a form of bullying. And then I think my parents, if they even, I probably didn't even tell them, but if, if I had, they probably would have agreed because they didn't want me going in the woods alone anyway. So they probably would have, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fascinating how like myths can lead to like other types of, other types of terror um, in some ways. I, when, when you brought up the boogeyman, I thought of Boo Radley immediately. And I wonder how much um, how much Harper Lee was influenced by that by that sense of like the boogeyman and like things in trees and but that's that's fascinating, Darcy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, in the interest of giving you writing time, we're going to move on a to the next component, which I think is what we've all been like really, really, really waiting for. It's like let me write already. So now writing time. Choose one of the myths you teased into structural components and or elaborated on, and then you can choose to either continue adding details until it fits the genre you want, whether that's poetry, pro, um, prose, any kind of hybrid or playing with any kind of form, um, or you can take structural components and expand on that and keep teasing it out and see what other things are connected to this. Or you can write close your eyes and touch type or close your eyes and use like use a notebook. You can get specific and don't be afraid to deviate from the myth or the path or the structure. So I'm going to give you, for sake of time, I'll give you 10 minutes for this and then we'll be able to kind of wrap, I'll wrap things up on here and then we'll have some time to, um, to share. So let me set timer for 10 minutes. Finally, it's writing time. Okay. And I'll put that in the chat.
Seven five cups. We're about one minute left, so just start wrapping up or finding a good place to leave your writing for now so you can restart it later. All right, that's the timer. So um, I'm going to go through the rest of the slides just so they are on the presentation that's going to be posted. And then we'll have a minute or so at the end for you to share if you want what came up for you or to share your work. So let me go through the slides first and then we'll end the recording and then we'll come back. So then again, there's optional share or what came up. And when we get to that point after the recording, you can share your whole piece or part or just what it felt like to use mythology as methodology. Bonus, if we had time for more writing time, consider the components that made up what you've written and what else is possible within that framework. Can one character or element be pulled out for their or its own work? Can any longer parts be divided into multiple sections? Consider the macro view and your work's relationship to the original myth or structure. Is anything left out? Is it left out on purpose? Or are you just focusing on one element? Then we would have a final share. And thank you. This is my email. That's me on Twitter if you want more um, of me. There's, again, like my email and my website. And that's it. We can stop the recording. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.